Hi guys and welcome to Crime Dog Season 1. Now when you think of France, you probably think of images like the Eiffel Tower, Le Tour Eiffel, a delicious wine, du vin délicieux, amazing uh, croissants, which is uh, croissant, it's the, it's the same word. All this is about to change. We are going to take you on a journey and discover some of the most hideous crimes in French history. You won't find this, my fellow crime dogs, in any guidebook. This first case we're going to discuss has mystified France for nearly 40 years now. A four-year-old boy goes missing from his garden in a small town in the north of France. And what happens in this case is really difficult to believe. So welcome to case number one, Little Gregory. It's 1981 and Little Gregory is the one-year-old son of young couple Jean-Marie and Christine Vilma. Uh, they live in a small town in the northeast of France called Lepagne sur Vologne. Sur Vologne means on the Vologne River, and this will be very significant later on. So, Christine is a factory worker, and Jean Marie, he's just got a promotion recently. He's a foreman. He's the most successful member of the family, with the other relatives living close by in neighboring villages. In 1981, with his promotion in the back and things going well, they decide to build a new house, slightly further away from the family, on the outskirts of the village. And this is where all the problems start. But they only get a phone line put in in July of 1981, and pretty much straight away, they start to receive some bizarre phone calls. They don't know who it's from, and the person at the beginning isn't even speaking. You can just hear this person breathing into the, into the receiver. So they don't think much of it. Uh, after a while, these calls become a little bit more bizarre, threatening. This person starts to speak, but the voice is distorted in some way. So it's, it's difficult to tell uh, who's on the other end. I've listened to a lot of these recordings and you can't even tell if it's a man or a woman, never mind identify uh, who's actually calling. As you may have guessed, this caller is going to play a very important role in this story. And in the French media, this person will be known as le corbeau. So le corbeau in English is the crow. And this is a reference to a, an old French film. I think it was uh, in 1943. And it was a film about a person who was harassing the residents of this small town and spreading libelous information about people. And this would soon turn into violence in, in the film. The Crow doesn't just target Jean-Marie and Christine, he harasses other family members too, especially Jean-Marie's parents, Albert and Monique, often discussing intimate family details and Jean-Marie's recent promotion. But this goes on for um, almost a couple of years and the family are getting sick of it, so they go to the police. And the police can't really do very much because back then they couldn't really trace the calls. This person wasn't actually harming them in any way, but they they take it seriously and they tell the family to start recording the calls. And I'm going to play one of them for you straight away. The next year, in 1983, the crow takes it to the next level. He specifically threatens Jean-Marie and for the first time as well, his son, Gregory. Here's the call that the crow put him. I will put a bullet between your two shoulders and if I miss, I will bring you oranges in the hospital. In fact, I will target your son instead. This will hurt you more. Don't let him out of your sight. I'm watching him with binoculars. If I find him outside, I will take him and you will find him in the river. This is a, obviously a pretty terrifying call to receive. I'm not sure what to make of the, the comment about the oranges. Let me know in the comments if you think there's any significance to that, some kind of code maybe, but it was a terrifying call. The family don't really know what to make of these calls and soon it goes to another level. The, the crow starts to write them letters as well. He knows exactly where they are and he knows intimate details about them. 
In these letters, he refers to Jean-Marie as the chef. Chef in French, it could be a chef in a kitchen, for example, a chef de cuisine. But in this case, uh, we're talking about a chef as in like a, a boss, a supervisor. I don't know what you guys think, but the fact that he keeps referring to the word boss maybe suggests that this person worked with Jean-Marie or this person is jealous of his position. These letters, the, the language and the, the violence in them continues to escalate. On the 16th of October, 1984, everything comes crashing down for this poor family. On that day, Gregory is out playing in his garden. His mum is inside and she's doing some ironing. She hasn't seen him for a while, so she pops out to check up on him, but she can't see him anywhere. She scours the whole garden and nothing. She sprints over to the neighbor's house to see if there's any sign of him over there, but nothing. So this is a small rural town. Uh, kids just don't go missing in a place like this, but she is panicking now. Now it is about to get a whole lot worse for Christine, because at the same time, Jean-Marie's brother receives a phone call. And guess who it is? It's the crow, he's back. And you're not gonna believe what he says. It's pretty horrendous. I'm calling you because there is no answer next door. I have taken my revenge on the boss and I have kidnapped his son. I have strangled him and I have thrown him in the Valonia. His mother is out there looking for him, but she won't find him. My revenge is complete. So as we discussed earlier, the Valonia is the, the river that runs close by to this village. And basically this person has confessed to taking the little boy and throwing him in the river. This is a pretty crazy phone call to receive. So Jean-Marie's brother, Michel, he calls the police straight away and they start looking for the kid. Just a little side note here, it's very unorthodox for a killer to call the family and confess to the crime. This person is completely unhinged, it would seem. They're frantically searching the river, looking for any sign of the kid. And we're about five miles away, about 9 p.m. And there's a volunteer fireman who's helping with the effort. And he's looking down in the water and he thinks he sees something kind of wedged between two rocks. But unfortunately, everyone's worst fears are confirmed. It's the lifeless body of little Gregory wearing his blue anorak. His hands and his feet are bound together and there's a rope around his neck keeping his hut in place. It doesn't look like he's suffered any abuse and there's no real signs of violence on the body. The next day, the parents have barely started to grieve and they receive a letter and it's from the crow again. Small side note here, the letter was postmarked the previous day at 5.15 p.m. This will be more significant when we investigate the case further later. I'll translate the letter for you. I hope that you will die of grief, boss. Your money won't be able to bring back your son. This is my revenge, stupid fool. So what started a few years ago with some prank calls has ended in cold-blooded murder. So the investigation starts straight away, and all they have to do is find the crow. If they find the crow, then they find the killer. I'm just gonna go over the timeline quickly, just so you can get an idea of how this went down. Gregory was snatched from his home between around 5 and 5.15 p.m. The letter was posted from the post office around 5.20, and then about 10 minutes later, around 5.30, the call came in to Jean-Marie's brother, Michel, basically confessing to the crime. So this person managed to accomplish quite a lot in a very short space of time. It's possible that the crow was working alone and was just very organized, or maybe this person was working with someone else. So four days later, Gregory's funeral takes place, and it is a media circus. This is a short clip from the funeral. <laughs> Une mère qui criait sa douleur à l'enterrement du petit Grégory. Dans la foule, les gendarmes sont là. Pour eux, aucun doute, l'assassin de l'enfant assiste à la cérémonie. Tout le monde est suspect. There were so many journalists there, and it must have been a struggle for the family with all this pressure. Also at the funeral, there was a heavy police presence. They were convinced that the killer would be at the funeral, so they were scouring the crowd to see if anyone looked suspicious. This killer seemed so arrogant, I wouldn't be surprised if the crow was stood right next to Christine and Jean-Marie at the funeral. The guy put in charge of this case is a young judge called Lambert. 
Lambert has only recently graduated from law school and has very little experience. When Gregory is murdered, he is suddenly thrust into the media spotlight and is quickly overwhelmed. So because of the intense press coverage around this case, the police feel under massive pressure to get a result quickly. All they have to go on really is the handwriting from the, the letters that the Crow made and the calls that came in. On the 5th of November 1984, this whole case is blown wide open. A man named Bernard Laroche, who is the cousin of Jean-Marie, is arrested and he is charged with the murder of Gregory. So Bernard, he has a wife whose name is Marie-Ange and she has a sister. Sorry, there's a lot of characters in this story. The sister's name is Muriel and she, under interrogation by the police, claims that having been picked up from school by Bernard, they then drive to the Vilma residence, pick up Gregory, down they go to the river. Bernard gets out of the car and then when he comes back, Gregory's not with them anymore. So she tells this to the police and it's their lucky day. They'd already been looking into Bernard because his handwriting was pretty similar to that of the crow. And along with this confession, they have every right to arrest him and hold him. Just when we think this case is solved, the, the day that Bernard is arrested, Muriel, whose confession had put him in there in the first place, she retracts her statement. She says she made the whole thing up because she was being pressured by the police. So we know from previous cases that the police can put a lot of pressure on a witness to get the answer that they want. And maybe this was the case here. So she just told them what they wanted to hear. When she got home, it's very conceivable that she was convinced by Bernard's wife to change her story. So up until this day in 2022, she sticks to this version of events that Bernard didn't take Gregory and he had nothing to do with his disappearance or murder. The police don't believe her and with the evidence from the handwriting and the fractured relationship that Bernard had with Jean-Marie, they keep him in prison. At the same time, they find a couple of discrepancies in Muriel's story. She claims that when she got back home, Bernard was already there. But when they questioned Bernard, he says that when he got there, Muriel was already at home. So someone's lying there. He stays in prison until February of 1985, but they just don't have enough evidence to keep him in there. The handwriting and the forced confession isn't enough, and he's released. As soon as Bernard is released, the, the press are all over it, and they quickly find Jean-Marie and ask him what he thinks about Bernard being released. And he is livid. He is convinced that Bernard killed his son. And pretty much on live TV, he, he says he's going to kill his cousin Bernard. Marie-Ange, Bernard's wife, she wants police protection. She's basically just seen Jean-Marie threaten to kill her husband on live TV. So she asks the police for help for some kind of protection, but they're not interested. They're on their own. Bernard is released and about a month later, they get more experts in to analyze the handwriting because that's all they've got to go on at the moment. And you'll never guess who is the next suspect. It's Christine Vilma, Gregory's mum. Now this is a crazy twist. Poor Jean-Marie, his kid has been killed and now his wife has been accused of the murder. So this is all getting too much for Jean-Marie and on the 29th of March, he takes matters into his own hands. Bernard, he's on his way home with his wife and his son Sebastian. And then out of nowhere, Jean-Marie arrives and he points his rifle at his chest. Bernard is shocked and just has the time to say that he had nothing to do with this. But Jean-Marie, he's already made up his mind and he pulls the trigger, killing Bernard instantly. So he's obviously then convicted of killing his own cousin and in 93, he goes to prison for five years. This seems like a pretty lenient sentence for uh, committing a murder, but I think the judge, having looked at the case and the circumstances, he felt very sorry for Jean-Marie, so he gave him a particularly light sentence. 1986 now and the parents of Gregory are really pushing to get some results in this case. They even contact President Mitterrand to try and help in some way. In the end, Lambert steps down and he's replaced by a more experienced judge who the family are confident can get results. You're not going to believe this, he's really got his teeth into the case, but he suffers a heart attack. I mean, what are the chances? So he wakes up in hospital and get this, he's got amnesia. He can't remember anything that's happened in the case. 
It's not until 2017 that we get the next big break in this case. And once again, it's members of the family. This time it's Marcel and Jacqueline Jacob. Marcel is the uncle of Jean-Marie and they've had a very tricky relationship their whole life. Now, new techniques are available and they've managed to look into the handwriting a bit more and they are pretty convinced that Jacqueline was the author of at least five of the letters written by the crow. They also analyzed some of the calls and they could hear in the background this person walking down steps, it seemed. So they counted the steps and there was 13. And guess how many steps are outside Jacqueline and Marcel's house? You guessed it, 13. So with this evidence, they arrest the elderly couple. And once again, the police don't have enough to go on. You can't put someone in prison because of handwriting. So once again, the case is dismissed. In the same year, Judge Lambert, the original judge on the case, he takes his own life. I think the, the years of struggle with this case and the pressure he was under, it was really tough and he decided he couldn't go on anymore. People can seem so confident when on TV or in the, in the public limelight, but you don't really know what's going on in their lives. We're in 2022 now and the case is still unsolved. If this case had taken place today, it would have been really easy for the police to catch the crow. They would have traced the calls, they would have taken DNA from the letters. Uh, but back then the technology didn't exist or it was just getting going and they were unable to find the crow using these techniques. I'm also surprised that they didn't look into the, the phone records a bit more. I would think that back then they would have been able to see who had been calling the family because these calls, um, there was hundreds of them. The police investigation was a bit of a mess from the start. They pretty much went through the whole family accusing them of the murder of Gregory. But with a lack of evidence each time, these people were released one by one. To this day, Christine and Jean-Marie continue the fight to bring Gregory's killer to justice. But the truth is, we may never know who killed that young boy back in 1984. That is a wrap on case number one. I really hope you enjoyed this video. If so, please give it a like and subscribe for some more fascinating crime content. Until next time, au revoir.